do things at this point. So it's I'm justifying my own, you know, forgetfulness. Saying that, yeah, we don't need it. Not yet. Okay, so at this point we can see that on line 11, we did accomplish what we set out to do. Because when you look at the initial values of x and y, you'll be in column f and g. They started off with the values 16 and negative 5, and now at this point, they end up with the value of negative 5 and 16. So if, when you look at x and y, their values are correctly exchanged. There's no problem, okay? Except for what we, what we are going to do on line 8. What are we doing on line 8? It's the end of a subroutine. We've got several things to do. Redline and DLC. Yep. So redline says you'll continue execution on line 15. We'll make a note of that. And then we deallocate. What columns are we deallocating? Uh, e, F, G, H. So we are taking these four columns and deallocate them which also means the values that we have just exchanged is now we did not keep the exchanged values exactly what we did to x and y as parameters into exchange did not do a single thing to local variables i j i and j in main that is the problem with a pass by value parameter it does not change whatever was used to specify the parameters because the parameters has their own storage to store values. So yes, the algorithm is in fact correct. We exchange the values of the parameters just fine. But the parameters did not link back to whatever I used earlier on line 14 to specify the parameters. So when we get back into line 15, which is in main, you can see that the values of i and j have not changed. Okay, So the program did not accomplish what it is supposed to do because there's no linking from parameters x and y to local variables i and j. But on line, on line 15, we have to look at post here, make a note, this is my next line to execute, and then we deallocate these columns as well. So format, text, strike out. It's okay though, we just deallocated those anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, well, we but we do want to see columns, in this case C and D, <laughs> to get exchanged. That's what we want to see. Okay, well, you can just insert a print statement, okay, you know, to make use of it. But the idea is I want to exchange the values of column C and column D, but this particular program did not get it accomplished. Are there any questions about the trace at this point and why this program is not doing what I want it to do? Does everybody understand what I want it to do? Go ahead. Um, how did you get from line 14 to line 14? From line 14, because line 14 is an invocation to exchange. So when we um, invoke a subroutine, we set up all the columns that we need, and then we continue execution on the first line in the subroutine. And line 5 is the first line that actually does something. So lines 2, 3, and 4, they don't do a single thing. All they do is to explain what is x, what is y, and what is t. So they don't really do any operation. And that's why the first line we execute in the subroutine is line 5. Okay. All right. So this is a program that did not work, but it has to, it has to do with the limitations of a by-value parameter. So what we'll do next is to, you know, look at another program based on what we have here. So we'll do a copy and paste because for the most part it is the same program with minor differences in terms of text. So I'm going to change line 2 and line 3 so it's no longer by val. This time it is by, val, by ref, which is by reference, passing by reference instead of passing by value. So syntactically this is one change and also Whenever you pass something by uh, reference, instead of using a left, instead of a right arrow, it is now a double-sided arrow. Okay? This is just really just in pseudocode. You know, just in this class, in C and C++, you obviously don't use uh, uh, double arrows or even single arrows. But in this class, I use a double arrow. Whenever we pass something by reference, I use a double-sided arrow. Why do you think it is a double-sided arrow? Because basically, creating a symbolic link between the two. 
is a exactly it is a protocol symbolic link between the two. Whatever happens to X will happen to I as well. So the changes go backwards. Okay. So we'll see how this is actually implemented when we trace this code. So this is the new code, minor, minor changes. Okay, so just to point out where I made the changes, these are the three lines where I made some changes. And just so that you can identify the changes easier, I'm highlighting these three lines. Okay, these are the only three lines that I made changes to. But in terms of execution, it is going to do something that is a, quite a bit different. Okay, so instead of copying and pasting the program execution, I'm going to just work out all the uh, roles again here. There's nothing to specify as a precondition because once again we do not have any global variables. We always start execution on in main, so we start on line 16, uh, which is invoking main. So in this case, it's pretty much the same thing as last time. Return line number, local variable i, local variable j, return line number is post, i is unknown, and j is unknown as well because they are local variables. So nothing really surprising at this point. We continue execution on line 12, i gets a value of 16. On line 13, j gets a value of negative 5. No changes, okay? But on line 14, we'll start to see some changes, okay? Let's, uh, I think that's good. We still allocate the same number of columns, four columns. One for return line number, so that we can remember, oh, when we are done, we're supposed to go back to line 15. One is for uh, parameter x, one for parameter y, and one for local variable t. Local variable, local variable t obviously has not changed. It is still a local variable starting with an unknown value. So the question mark still goes in here. So column h is still the same as last time. But column f and column g are now quite different. Instead of having their own value of 16 and negative 5, they now become aliases of another column. Each one becomes the alias of another column. X is an alias of I, or column C. Y is an alias of J, which is column D. So when we use an alias, I would use AKA, okay, also known as column C, and then AKA column D. I do not refer to the names I and J anymore. Because the name I and J only makes sense when you're in main, because they are local variables. Now that we are not in main, it makes no sense whatsoever if I call this AKA I or AKA J. So instead of referring to the names of the column, I refer to the column itself. So that's why I refer to column C and column D. Is that okay? Because this is actually a really important part of the concept. Okay. When you get to the next class, you know, uh, in C and C++, you, you will, it, it's, this is going to be an interesting transition to C and C++. I'll talk about that later, okay? But for now, we'll talk about the concept of passive by reference. All right, so... Right, because in, in C++ you can have passing by reference, in C you cannot. So there's a kind of like a little bit of a difference here. Okay, line 5 is going to be a little bit different from before, but not a whole lot. Okay, because on line 5 of the, of the student code, the right hand side is still referring to the expression x. So you look up x here, which is column f, do you see a numerical value in that column, in column f? Does it have a value of 16 or negative 5 or anything like that? No, it has no value by itself because it is saying that, hey, I'm just an alias of another column. So what do you need to do if you want to get a value for x? You just follow it, right? You say, okay, if x is an alias of column C, what is the value of column C? Well, the value of column C is 16. So 16 becomes the right-hand side of line 5. Are there any questions about that concept? When you see an alias, you follow the alias to the column that it refers to, and then you say, OK, what is the value of that column? So in this case, you know, x is, a, is an alias of column C. Column C has a value of 16. 
That's why the expression x all by itself also has a value of 16. So we end up storing that 16 into variable t, okay? Local variable t ends up with a value of 16. So you might say, oh, okay, so it's still doing exactly the same thing as last time. So what is the big deal of this passing by reference business? Let's look at the next line, okay? The next two lines to be exact. On line six, the right-hand side is easy to evaluate, okay? The right-hand side of line six is simply y. You look at you look up y in column G. It says, okay, I'm an alias of column D. So you look up a, you look up column D. Column D has a value of negative five. So the right hand side of y six is just negative five. The question is, what? Uh, where are we going to store that? Okay, we are going to store that into X. This is the big difference between the two programs. So instead of overwriting column F and say, oh, x now has a value of negative 5, you don't do that, okay? You do not do this. Instead, because x is an alias of column C, you update column C. So that's why on line 6, column C is the one that is updated to negative 5. This is the big change from the previous program. In other words, you do not overwrite an alias. You let an alias remain just as an alias. You change what it refers you to. Yep. Sorry, just so I understand the definition of alias. So x and y or y I'm sorry, columns f and g are aliases, but h is not. Column f and g are aliases and column h is not. Yep. Column h is a local variable, so it, it has its own value. So, so this is the big change. Let me go ahead and highlight it because I think it is kind of important. Um, line seven. Once you understand line six, line seven is not a is not a big change because we just use t, which has a value of sixteen, to update y. But once again, y is an alias. We do not update column G. Instead, we update whatever it refers to. It's an alias of column D, so it is column D that we are updating with a value of 16. So this is really kind of interesting because column C and D normally are out of the scope of the exchange subroutines. So in other words, exchange has no visibility of the names I and J of main. Of main. But the pass by reference parameter mechanism allows main to say, a exchange, you might need to know where to find my variable i and where to find my variable j. So that is the mechanism how exchange can modify something that does not belong to it. And yet, we are not using any global variables. Is that okay? I will use an analogy after I'm done with this entire program. So this way, hopefully, it will give you an idea of, okay, but what exactly is like a reference in real life? So now we get to uh, line eight, which is the end of a subroutine. Line eight is still doing the same thing as before. Okay, we look up the return line number, make a note that we have to continue execution on line 15, and then we deallocate the four columns. So we are deallocating X and Y just like last time, but what we are deallocating are not the values associated with x and y, because x is just a reference, it's just an alias, and same as y. So we're deleting, we're removing the aliases, but without changing what they're referring to. So we, we, so I will give you an analogy, and hopefully that will help you remember what it really means when we're passing by reference. On line 15, you know, we are gonna deallocate these three columns after we make a note to continue execution at post. So we take these three, paste it. Let me see if I can use my uh, keyboard faster. O, T, S. Okay, there we go, O, T, S. Okay, so that, that concludes the execution of this new program. And you can see it has a very subtle change from the previous one. Let me give you an analogy, so this way it is easier for you guys to kind of remember what we talked about. And I would use the analogy in a new program, but without tracing it. I'll just explain what happens when we do it. So define sub um, vandalize. Okay. Uh, 
vandalized and it has a it has a parameter. Okay, and the first one is by value. Uh, it's some kind of a book. Okay, that you're vandalizing. So you will uh, use use whiteout pair pages of. Uh, how else do you vandalize a book? Submerge book in paint. Water, come on. We can we can be a little bit more inventive here. Hydrochloric acid. Ink. And define so. Okay, so this is you know this is a vandalizing subroutine. It will vandalize whatever you pass to it. And here is main. Main has a local variable book. It will basically say author book and then we're going to invoke vandalize vandalize okay i'm going to change the name of this one so it's, it's easy to tell which one is which one so this is my book okay. same thing as this one here i just want to make it very clear what we are passing and what we are dealing with so i'm going to use my book to specify the parameter book of the subroutine vandalize and oh let's publish it after vandalizing publish my book and define sub invoke main there we go all right so we have this kind of completely you know analogy type of you know pseudocode here but i think it will help to illustrate the concept okay so we once again we start execution on line 13 right we go to main and um, what it does is, on by the time we get to main, we have a blank pile of paper that has no content in it, okay, or no specific no specific content. So it won't be there won't be any actual content until line nine when I author my book, okay. So I'll start to write my story on the book just like that. The question is, what is happening on line ten when I invoke the vandalized subroutine? And use my book to specify the pass by value parameter book in vandalize. What is being done here? Okay, let me just highlight the line because I think it is kind of important. On line 10, what is happening is I am going to a photocopier. Okay? I make a photocopy of my book and I hand over the copy, the Xerox of the book to vandalize and say, okay, here's what, you, what you're supposed to vandalize. Okay, so now, technically speaking, we have two books. One is called my book, which is the book where the actual story is, and then the other one is a photocopy of my book, which is the by value parameter, parameter book that vandalize has, has access to. Okay, so I step over as the vandalize the subroutine, so I start to write out you know, certain pages. I start to tear out certain pages and submerge the you know, book in ink. Okay, so I end, I end up with a mess. What do I do with that mess by the time I get to line six? Throw it away. I put it into the recycler. Okay. Right. I mean that's what happens to anything that is specific to an invocation. So after line six, I return to line 11 and publish, quote unquote, my book. So am I publishing a book that has white house, pages torn off, and the entire thing you know, submerged in ink? Nope. That happened to the Xerox of the original book. What I publish is the book that I always have after the authoring. That's passive by value. Are we doing okay so far? So what you need to remember is the Xerox machine and what we are Xeroxing. We are Xeroxing the entire book. Is that okay? All right. So now I'm going to change my program and say, okay, let's change this program a little bit. We change it by, to by reference. And in this class and only in this class, we use a double-sided arrow to emphasize that this is passed by reference. So when you look at the text representation of the program, it hasn't changed much, okay? Just a little bit. And you see a C++ is even worse. Because you know when you pass by reference, you just put a little ampersand before 
the parameter itself. That's the only visual clue that you have that this is not passed by value, and instead it is passed by reference. So here, I'm trying to give you multiple visual clues that we are passing by reference. So let's see what happens when I execute this program. Nothing really changes when we do here, okay? We just allocate my book here, you know, which is kind of blank or with no content actually you know, specified. I author my book, I actually write the content of my book, and then I invoke vandalize to and pass quote unquote my book to book. We're still using the Xerox machine. We're still passing something to the subroutine. But what are we passing? We, I'm putting, assuming my book is, can be found in the library, okay? I am writing down the call number of that book. And make a photocopy of that call number and then give the photocopy of the call number to vandalize. So vandalize is not, not vandalize is no longer holding a phone of Xerox of the entire book. Vandalize is now holding onto a Xerox of the call number of the book. Okay? Now I just want to make sure because you know this is a different generation from my own or you know, Several generations in between you and me. Does everybody understand what is a call number? Does anyone want me to explain what? Okay, go ahead. What is a call number? Okay, what is a call number? Very good. Okay, because I kind of knew that this would happen because you know that's kind of like a really old concept. Okay, call number in the context of a library. Okay, uh, call numbers, each book in the library has a unique call number. A call number is like an address. It tells us where the book is located in the library. So when you look at computer science books, it's typically started with a QA79 something, okay? So those, this entire section, you know, this, I think there's probably at least a whole shelf in the library referring to QA79. 78, and then it will be sorted based on the call number, so you can quickly locate the book that you want to locate when you are given the call number. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so it's basically, a, a, it's, a, it's an address, okay, except it's not a, a, a street number, a street name, and a city, instead it is a slightly different way, different way of describing the location, how to find something. Okay, so given that is explained, getting back to my example, so now, vandalize has a call number. What do you do with a call number? In other words, when I say on line three, four, and five, do you think vandalize is gonna wipe out the call number and tear, you know, tear up the little piece of paper with a call number and then put that thing in ink? Is that how you use a call number? No, instead, what do you think vandalize is going to do with the call number? It will use the call number, go to the library, buy that book, then they do all these awful things to the book. Okay, so, but that book is the very same book that I authored. It is not a copy of the book. This is the actual book that I authored. Is that okay? At the end of the subroutine vandalize on line six, okay, remember on line six or on the line that says end define sub, we are always going to destroy everything that is specific to the invocation of the subroutine. So in this case, what is specific to vandalize? The return address, okay, return my number, that's, that's a given. What about book? Again, what is book? Is it a photocopy of the original book? No. It's a photocopy of the call number. So what we are throwing into the, into the recycle bin or the shredder is not a copy of the book. It is simply a little slip of paper, a little post-it that has the call number of the book. Is that okay? So this time, my actual book actually ended up being vandalized, okay? So when I get when, I, when the execution of the program continue on to line 11, I am going to publish a vandalized book because the subroutine vandalized actually used the sub used the parameter book as a reference, as a, as a call number to locate the actual original book and did those awful things to the original book. 
So is that helping you understand you know, um, the concept of passive by reference as opposed to the concept of passive by value? You're still passing something to the subroutine. The subroutine is still destroying something in the end, but you're passing just the address of the file, how to find the original thing. It is not the, a copy of the original thing that you're passing to the subroutine. Are we still doing okay so far with these concepts? Okay, so let me take a poll here because you know I, I was told about several things about my analogies. Is the analogy helping or is it hurting? Or neither? Okay. Is helping? Is anyone thinking the analogy is actually making it worse, making it more confusing? No? Nope. Well, if you don't feel like you're know, raising your hand, you can send me an email. <laughs> or just text me right away. It's like, it's not helping. All right. So this is passing by reference, which is great, useful. Okay. All right. Are there any questions regarding all the concepts that we have talked about so far? The calling, invoking versus returning, which only involves return line open. The second part that we talked about are the local variables. Okay, so there are variables that are local to a particular subroutine, but they are actually allocated and deallocated on a per invocation basis. And then we talk about by value parameters, which are kind of like local variables, except by value parameters do not start with an unknown value. Instead, the initial value of by value parameters are specified by the invoke statement that got the execution that uh, started in the first place. And then today, we just talked about by reference parameters, where you're passing the way to find something to a subroutine, but not a copy of something into the subroutine. So are those concepts okay? All right. So the next thing we'll do is to talk about returning a value from a subroutine. But the first question is, why do we need that when we have passing by reference? Because it seems like you know, passing by reference gives us a way to pass information back out of a subroutine, which is one of the things that they're supposed to do. Dynamically using the result is the problem. Okay. So let's say we want to define a subroutine called, I'm not going to trace this one, so we'll just define the subroutine add, okay? So to add two numbers means that we have to pass two values by value. So the number to add, the two numbers to add is x and y. And then the result, which I will refer to as parameter z, needs to be passed by reference because this is the one thing that I need to get back in order to use it somewhere else. So I would say z gets x plus y and define stuff. Yep. Okay. Not a big deal. This is pretty easy. Are there any questions about the subroutine add? It takes in you know two parameters x and y to specify the two numbers that I'm adding, and then the sum of those two numbers is going to be passed back to the caller using parameter z, which is passed by reference. No big deal. Okay. And then we'll do multiply. Okay, define sub multiply. Same thing. Okay, by value x, by value y, and by reference z. Z gets x times y this time. And define sub. Okay, no other big deal. All right. So now we have the main subroutine. In the main subroutine, I just want to do this calculation. Okay, I'm going to write it on the whiteboard and I'll try to code it in my program. All I want to do is to try to figure out uh, what is 3 plus 4, the whole thing, times 6 plus 7. Okay. I know you guys can do this in your head. You can come up with the answer right away. But I want to see how to express an expression that looks just like this using the multiply and the add subroutine. Because that eventually will explain why the concept of returning a value is useful. Okay. So in order to do this in main, the first thing I notice is main needs a local variable. Okay? In addition to the one that it's going to store the result. Okay. So let's say in main I want the entire thing to be stored in variable i. 
Okay. So main definitely needs a local variable i to store the actual result of the calculation. Okay, that's not a big deal. But in addition to i, I need something else. Because every single time I call add, it needs a place to store the value of the sum. Every time I call multiply, now multiply is not an issue because it can store the result directly into i. But add requires a different place. Okay? So I need a separate local variable. I just call that j. Okay. So now I need to do a j. Um, oops, not like that. So I need to invoke the subroutine um, add because we need to perform the add operation first. So I need to specify three as x, four as y. And the sum needs to store into variable j. So z, j is z. Is that OK? Because we are going to use the value of j later on. Is that OK? Now, I can try to be cheap and reuse var a local variable i. So this way, I can use you know, local variable i to store the sum of 6 and 7. So 6 specifies x, 7 specifies y, and then you know, uh, local variable i specifies j, uh, z. So with line 17, I am going to compute the sum of 6 and 7 and store the result into local variable i. It is OK, because later on, I can reuse local variable i. So the last operation, which is computing the multiplication, multiply. I'm going to use local variable i to specify x, which is one of the numbers to multiply, j to specify y, which is the other number to multiply, and then the result is going back into i. There's no problem with using i twice, once as a pass by value parameter, and once as a pass by reference parameter. There's no problem with this whatsoever. Okay? But I had to break it up into three separate lines because each line needs to specify a place to store a result, and I need local variables for that purpose. And the front sub, both main, just to, be, just to make this program complete. I mean, they don't really serve a whole lot of purpose other than making the program complete. Okay? I'm not going to trace this, because we already know the basic mechanism. But it is cumbersome, because what we can express on one single line as a math formula now needs to be broken up into little pieces. Is that okay? So the question is, why don't we need to separate this into those pieces that need extra variables when we express the whole thing as 3 plus 4 in parentheses times 6 plus 7 in parentheses? Why don't we need the extra variable for one thing? And why don't we have to separate this into multiple statements? What is the key concept that allows you know, the formula to be so simple? What happens to 3 plus 4, 4 in parentheses? The value of 3 plus 4 becomes one of the numbers for the multiplication. The value of 6 plus 7 becomes the other value for the multiplication without needing a place to store it first. Is that okay? In other words, we are immediately utilizing the result of 3 plus 4 without storing it first. We are immediately using the result of 6 plus 7 without storing it first. That's why it looks so clean, because we don't need extra variables to store the temporary or the intermediate results. Is that okay? So this is also a good time to talk about, you know, this is called infix, which means the operator is in the middle of the numbers that it is, is supposed to operate. Why do we use infix? Why do we put the operator between the values that the operator is supposed to operate on? Just take a guess. Visual clarity. Visual clarity, okay, that's one possible reason. 
You can you you are all looking at me for an answer, but I don't have an answer because I really don't understand why we use index as a convention. It's a convention, no more and no less. Okay, but when I say that, doesn't that immediately suggest that oh, you mean there are alternatives to index notation? There are other ways to specify the operator. Or HP calculators, old HP calculators. So this is called infix notation. Okay. So this is called infix notation, which means between. Okay. So let's take a look at the prefix notation. Prefix notation means we specify the operator prior to the values that it's supposed to operate on. So the very same expression is now going to be the last operation is a multiply. What is it multiplying? The sum of 3, 4, and the sum of 6, 7. That's the infix notation. Okay. Visually, which one is better? Well, we are, we are used to this one. It doesn't mean it really is a better notation. Yeah, but 3, 4 could also be 34. 3, space, 4. But visually, <laughs> visually, unless you have grid paper or something, uh, visual space can be subjective on how far a space should be. Uh, so visual clarity in, uh, in fixing makes more sense. Sort of. But one of the problems with the prefix notation is it's a lot of parentheses. Okay? What about postfix? If, the, if I use the name postfix, it means the operator is after the values that they're supposed to operate on, which is even more odd if you think about it. It's like, what? You know, we specify the, operate, the, the values first, and then we say what to do with those values? Exactly. You say three, and then you say four, and then you say add those two together. You say, you say six, you say seven, you say add those two together. Now, this will give you a value. This will give you a second value. So now that we have two values, you can say, hey, let's multiply those two. That's postfix notation. So we, now we got infix, prefix, and postfix notation. So your hunch was right. I was about to suggest that there are other ways to specify operators other than what we conventionally use as infix notation. Are there any questions about this part? So you guys know how to do postfix notation? Does it mean that I, in the next exam, I can give you a general formula and you can convert it into the postfix notation? Mm -hmm. Let's do an exercise. Let's see how 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 much you, how well prepared you guys are for postfix notation. The infix, I mean the prefix one is pretty easy. Okay, it's just you know what is the last operation and you work you work your way back. So let's look at this. A plus 2 to the power of 2, the whole thing divided by C times D. And then this entire thing, we want to add um, K divided by 2. OK. I think that's, that's OK. That's good enough. How do we express this entire thing? Using postfix notation. Well, with postfix notation, you specify the values first, and then you specify what to do with those values. So in other words, it's what we call a bottom-up type of approach. Okay, You start with the actual values first. So with this one, yeah, pretty, pretty obvious that we have A plus B you know, deal to deal with first. So you specify A, specify B, specify plus. And then you specify, this will give you a value. Okay, And then you specify 2. And they say we want to raise to the power of. And then the whole thing has to be divided by C and D, but I haven't computed C and the product of C and D yet. That's okay. Just leave this one as it is. It is being stored somewhere. And then we specify C, D, and then we say multiply those two. So now that we have this chunk giving me a value as the numerator, this chunk giving me a second value being the denominator, we can say, oh, divide those two. So that would give us this entire expression. What about the other side? Well, let's specify that. K to divide. So this will give us the second value. 
and then you just say add at the end, we're done. See how easy it is? See how clean this is compared to the index notation? Just imagine all your math classes using the postfix notation. They won't need all that whiteboard space in math classes anymore. And we won't need parentheses on the keyboard anymore either. Wouldn't that, that be a good thing? This is normal English. This is Yoda. <laughs> Luke, practice harder, right? Luke, harder, practice. You put the verb at the end. Luke, be kind to layer. Luke, layer, be kind to. That's postfix. It makes sense. If you're Yoda, you would look at postfix notation and say, yeah, everybody should, should be using postfix. Infix is weird. It's odd. Doesn't make any sense. Are there any questions about postfix notation? Okay. Yep. If infix is the convention, globally accepted convention, why is postfix useful? Aha! Uh -huh. Well, that's the next question I was about to ask. So I'm really glad that you guys are already thinking a little bit ahead of me. Okay. It's not because I like it. Even though I do like it, it doesn't really make it any more popular than it used to, than it would be. There are two reasons why uh, postfix notation is so useful in computer science. Number one, XP calculators. Now, when you guys go buy a calculator, you're buying a TI calculator, which natively understand infix notation. And I think your know, calculators are smart enough to display stuff like this. Right? I mean, it will display the actual formula the way we normally represent the, 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 the formula. Okay? Okay. But calculators were not always this you know, sophisticated and capable. So in the past, XP calculators did not really have the resources to do stuff like this. And did not even have the resources to understand parentheses. And trust me, parentheses are difficult to parse from the perspective of a computer. So what do they do? Infix note, I mean a postfix notation. So ask any engineer in their 40s or 50s. Okay, so go to an electrical, steel wool, mechanical engineer that you know, your uncle, maybe your dad, or so on. Yep, go ahead. So even on newer like calculators, the, the postfix would be more efficient? Or more if you know how to do the postfix notation, it will give you a smaller number of keystrokes, yes. Right. Because there are no parentheses. Um, but if you ask any engineers in the 40s, especially in the 50s or 60s, they will tell you that there's no option. Calculators did not understand infix notation whatsoever back in those days. They only understood postfix notation. And you guys would say, well, then you might as well use punch cards to write programs too, right? Because you know who, who needs to understand postfix now that computers are powerful enough to understand infix? PDF, Adobe. Okay, what is PDF? What does it stand for? Portable document format. Portable document format. So, how does it, you know, show graphic stuff and so on and so forth, so that you know you can zoom in as many times as you want to, and you still see like crystal clear details. How how is that done? Does anyone know? Does Thank anyone want to know? Yep, go ahead. Vector graphics. Vector graphics, exactly. In other words, instead of specifying you know, the bitmap that you want to paint on a piece of paper using a laser printer, it instead, it, instead of saying, OK, this pixel is black, this one is white, this one is black, white, white, black, black, white, and so on, on a monochrome you know, laser printer, it instead the command of let's draw a circle at the you know, center at this coordinate with a radius of this much and a thickness of this much. That's being sent to the printer. So when you send the same command to a 300 dpi printer, yeah, it will look like a circle, but under a microscope, you will start to see uh, the jagged edges. When you send the same command to a 1200 dpi printer, it will look better. If you send the com same, same command to a plotter, then it will look exactly like a circle, because that's what a plotter would do, okay? So that's, you know, that's PDF, okay, which is also, um, PDF is a, 
uh, is a descendant of PostScript, which is a printer language. Okay. Now, if you if you understand the name PostScript, doesn't that suggest that it is using postfix notation? That's what it is. It's still being used today in PDFs. Okay, there is actually code in PDF. When I say code, I'm not just talking about how where to draw a circle. I'm also talking about conditional statements, loops, and all the concepts that we are talking about. PDF is not really just a way to specify, oh, this is the content of a file. It is an, a full programming language by itself. You can actually do a lot of fun stuff with, with PDF. When was the last time the Ac Acrobat Reader got updated on your computer? Yeah, this morning? Why do you think there are so many patches to PDF Reader, which is only supposed to display the content of a file? And most of the time, remember, it's a PDF Reader. It is not something that can even modify a file. So why do you think there's so many updates related to security? Because you can put code in it. Exactly. Embed. Because you can embed code in it using postfix notation. Okay, so I hope that kind of answered your question of you know, the importance of postfix post -fix notation even in today's uh, computing. Okay. And the other thing is eventually you might specify this the, using the infix notation to your calculator. Eventually things are still happening like this using the postfix notation internal to the calculator. In other words, this is just how we see things. This, on the other hand, is how the calculator or the computer actually perform the operations. So the conversion between infix to postfix notation eventually becomes important to anyone who is working in the field of computer science. Is that okay so far? All right. Okay, so getting back to our example here, what do you think um, a subroutine call looks like? If you have to choose between the three, infix, prefix, and postfix notation, which one do you think it assembles the most? Just look at one line. Just look at line 16. Okay. What does it look like the most? Once again, the three choices are infix, prefix, or postfix. It is, it's, it's, it's about the order of where the verb is. Prefix. It's prefix, exactly. So we want to be able to do the prefix notation thing. In, in other words, maybe not using the symbols like the way the, it is here. Maybe we just say multiply, add, add. And then three and four are parameters. So the three goes to x, four goes to y. 6 goes to x, 7 goes to y. This whole thing goes to x, this whole thing goes to y of mult. That becomes prefix notation, doesn't it? That's the reason why I talk about infix, prefix, and postfix notation. OK, so let's look at that concept. OK, so we're going to look at an alternative format of this particular program, I'm going to insert a row here and say it would be kind of nice if we can do something like this. I get the last operation is a multiply, okay? We are going to pass something to the parameter x of multiply, something else to the parameter of uh, parameter y of multiply. What we are passing to x here is the result of adding three and 4. And then what we are passing here is the result of adding 6 and 7. Okay. So when you look at row 19, yes, I know there's still a lot of invoke, 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 which C does not actually do. But in this class, I want to emphasize that we are invoking a subroutine, and that's why they're there. But when you look at line 19, in many ways, it is still a whole lot better compared to line 16, 17, and 18, because we don't need that extra variable j anymore. We can actually invoke a subroutine and say, hey, whatever answer you have, I'm going to use it right away. 
but that requires a mechanism that we don't have because let me just highlight you know a portion so to kind of highlight what I mean by that when you look at this portion here okay when you just look at the highlighted portion it's it looks just like a normal invocation right but it is also at the same time providing a value that I can use to specify the parameter x of multiply. We don't have a mechanism to do that just yet. It is a return value concept. Okay. So are there any questions about the rationale of being able to specify a return value? Technically speaking, we don't really need it, but it does make your program look a lot cleaner if we have it. Because now we can say, hey, a subroutine can take the place of a particular value because a subroutine call, an invocation, actually can have its own value that can be used right away in place. How would you trace that? Aha. That's, let's see. We have no time to do it. Oh, yeah, 10 minutes, more than enough. So we'll go ahead and see how we can trace subroutines like this. And we'll start with something that's simple. Okay, something that is not going to involve parameters and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. So we'll define a subroutine called Johnny. And Johnny is going to return 5. Some people seem to understand the reference. Because this is a kind of older movie too, so not everybody understands that. Okay, main again, local variable i, i gets invoke Johnny, and define sub, invoke main. Okay, so this is my entire pseudocode to trace, to illustrate, using the simplest program to illustrate the concept of um, returning a value. So there are no parameters whatsoever, you know, no conditional statements, nothing too fancy. There we go. So now we want to trace it, line number. The precondition, once again, has nothing to say because there are no global variables. The first line outside of the subroutines is line 8, which invokes the main subroutine, which is the entry point of a C or C++ program. Return line number is going to be post just like before and we do have one local variable i that starts with an unknown value so up to this point there's nothing different from all the other programs that we have talked about so far then we go to line six line six is a little bit different okay we can't do things the same way as before anymore because when we invoke a subroutine okay so how many operations are involved on line six by itself I know there's the assignment operation, right? But any assignment operation also requires to know what is the right-hand side first. So we have two main operations on line six. The first one is to invoke Johnny first, to find out what the value is, which becomes our right-hand side, and then we use the right-hand side to update the left-hand side. So there are two things to do on this line. The first one being invoking Johnny. Okay, so we say, okay, we know how to invoke a subroutine. We have to specify the return line number and so on. But we can't do that anymore. Because when you specify a return line number, are you going to return to line 6 to finish up the assignment? Or are you going to return to line 7 to basically say, I'm done with line 6? Those are the only two choices when you can only specify a return line number. Because I cannot say, well, we kind of have to go back to line 6 first to finish up what is left on that line to do which is what I need to do. So instead of referring to this as a return line number, I'm just going to say return information. So this is a diff this is a deviation from what we have done so far. When you have an invoke statement where it is returning back with a return value, you have to specify return info. Okay, so how do we denote what is left on this line, line 6, to do? We do it this way. We say line 6. Okay, we're going back to line 6. What is left of line 6 to do is this. 
So the return info is saying that we are going back to line six, but in addition to knowing which line, which line, which line we're going back to, it also indicates what is left on that line to do. What about that question mark? The question mark is a placeholder, okay? It is the placeholder of the return value of joining. So whatever join is returning, whatever value join is returning, is going to replace this question mark. So by the time I get back to line six, I know exactly what value I should use to update i. Is that okay? Is the rationale okay so far? Because the notation can be very confusing unless people understand the rationale of the notation. Okay? So that's the return info, which is taking the place of return line number. We still have um, well, there's no, there's nothing else you know that we have to specify because Johnny has no parameters and no local variables. So now we go to um, line two, which is the first line inside Johnny, and this is the first time we see the statement return statement. A return statement is going to do one simple thing. It is going to use the value that you're returning to replace the question mark. That's all it's going to do. So the way we write this down is going to be a little bit cumbersome because the way we do it is to copy and paste the entire return info line, change the question marks to, to the value that we are actually returning. On line two, what value am I returning? Five, okay? Five is just a constant, just like that. Okay, in other words, the return statement is what is actually providing the value so that when the subroutine returns, the subroutine invocation has a value that you can say, okay, use this as a value. Is that okay? Okay. That's all line two is going to do. Oh, should we update column C at this point? No. Okay. The return statement only updates and changes the question mark to whatever value it's supposed to be. It does not actually carry out the operation itself. It just resolves what the question mark is. So after line two, we still go to line three. Line three is the one that is actually looking up, oh, where am I supposed to go back to? We're supposed to go back to line six. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky in terms of you know, the uh, notation. So O, T, S to strike out. So now that we are back to line six, what am I gonna do on line six? You have to use this to tell you what you're supposed to do on line six. Now when you do this in, the, in your homework assignment, I prefer to do it like this. In other words, instead of just telling me which line or what line number I'm going back to, in addition to the line number, I would also know what else I'm supposed to do on line six. Because otherwise, if you go back to line six, just by knowing that you're on line six, you might have to invoke Johnny again. This makes it clear that no, we just invoked Johnny, and Johnny returns with a value of five. So now let's make use of the value of five. So when you execute line six, but this time as i gets a value of five, okay, i gets a value of five, we are done with line six. Then we go to line seven, line seven make a note that we have to return to post, and then we have no use of these two columns anymore, OTS to strike out, and we're done with the execution. So I hope this answers the question of how do we represent returning a value in a trace. Can a single subroutine and pseudocode return multiple values in the scope of this class? In the scope of this class, we do not do that. In the scope of C and C++, you can return a structure, but not an array. When you do return a structure, you have to use the structure right away. Which also means, you know, you kind of, it, it, it has limited application. You can do it, but it has limited application. All right, so are there any questions about this particular example? Now, is this anything new? I mean, you know, should we, or can I study this in, my, in the notes or not? Let's check out the notes here. And I have no idea where, oh right here. So if you go back to the notes here, go back to updated uh, subroutine notes, and go to the return value section.
do we see something similar to what we just saw? So instead of you know Johnny, we have another character from uh, Star Trek Voyager. Well, seven of nine, but this is just seven. But it's the same thing, and this one also has a full trace to show you the rationale of each line and what happens when we execute the program itself. So if you haven't read this before, this is a good time to read it before Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, we'll take everything that we have talked about so far in subroutine, because we are done with subroutines. We have talked about everything there is to talk about in the context of this class. Does that mean I have shown you everything that you can possibly do as combinations of these concepts? Not even close. Okay, so we are going to rewrite the factorial subroutine at this time, making use of parameters and the return value. Okay, so that the entire thing only needs one, two, three, four, five lines as the body of the subroutine, and so we'll deal with that on Wednesday. Okay. But before we talk about that, make sure that you read the notes and understand all of the concepts first, okay? Because at this point, we have covered everything in subroutines. All right. Yep. Yes. That will happen on Wednesday because you still have an actual homework that is due on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, I'll give you the next one.